black gold of the sun. Classic. Look. Um, I have a friend uh, in the States, um, of course I'm sitting here in South Africa, I've been here for a while, and uh, uh, Nelson Davis out of Atlanta, Georgia. Uh, well, he used to be in New York, he's out of Atlanta now. Hotland, as they say. And he sends me stuff, you know, cultural stuff, just just, just stuff, so I like, keep in touch so that way, and plus whatever else I get on the internet, whatever have you. Yeah, but I depend a lot on, on, on Nelson. He sent me an article where his brother was talking about uh, uh, basically, uh, uh, Africans are your enemy. Talk about Africans are African Americans' enemy and black people's enemy in the States. And he went through this whole thing. And uh, so I wrote a response back. I think I posted something on, on, on Google Plus. Um, um, basically, he's both right, very right, and very wrong. Um, let me, this is going to take a little while, and give you some context, as they say. <clears throat> okay. Uh, first of all, I came of age uh, in, in the school of the 50s and 60s of the you know, South Bronx of New York City in the United States of North America, in that wilderness there. And uh, I grew up in a place called, um, well, the South, the Mount Haven section of the South Bronx in the Patterson Projects. Now, at that time, we were, as we say, totally integrated. My next door neighbors, it was a project development. And we had three apartments in our section, and there's, and I can't, we had a six story building. We also had uh, 13 story buildings in, in Patterson Projects. Um, and my next door neighbors were white, next to them were Puerto Rican, and we were a black family upstairs. It was, we would, everybody there was just poor, what I would call now the downtrodden. So, uh, so we, we shared that. Um, uh, even though we still, you know, you have these cultural differences, but but everybody was it was a homogenous mix in there. Okay, um, so that's how we grew up. Now, interestingly enough, um, we had this thing. So as black people go, we we tr like um, the poor Puerto Ricans. Um, they we we sort of they were with us long enough that they knew how to dress, how to coordinate colors, and all the rest of that stuff. Right? Okay, great. Uh, so we, we were cool. Later on, when the, when the Jamaicans and also came, they used to these color coordinations. We just said, well, hey, 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 hey. But we gave up on them. But let me go back. Around about 1965, a bunch of things happened. Uh, first of all, uh, Lyndon Johnson and, and, you know, and the United States government, they uh, overthrew the, um, uh, the Dominican Republic president. I think that they replaced him with this dictator, Trujillo, or whoever it was. Um, so that what, what what that caused is a lot of Dominicans came up to the states and more importantly to New York. Now here's the thing: we did not know they were Dominicans. The reason we did not know they were Dominicans because they look so much like Puerto Ricans and they just sort of blended in, you know. Okay, was the much later we realized that. Okay, because they, they wouldn't even identify themselves as Dominicans. They would say they would just speak Spanish and we'd say, well, in fact, we just we didn't even say Puerto Ricans or Dominicans. We just say Spanish people. That's how we talk back then. Now let me just skip just a little bit ahead. I just want to put a little context on here. Um, but before I get to that, um, uh, I need to say this. In um, uh, 1969, somewhere around that, yeah, 69, 68, 69, uh, we took over, uh, as a student, and uh, we took over Bronx Community College. It was the time that they were taking over a lot of colleges, you know, demanding certain things like that's so Columbia, you know, uh, San Francisco State, uh, or Yale, um, you know, it was City College, you know, New York. Um, so on uh, uh, Bronx Community College, we did the same thing. What we were protesting for or trying to get was uh, more black studies and more black um, um, lecturers, professors, if you will, or teachers into these colleges. Okay. Uh, so that was our, 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 our thrust. It was a struggle. Uh, and at the same time, you know, we just, just the, the black power movement was going on. You had the civil rights struggle in the South, black power in the, in the North. Was, we struggling, struggling, struggling to get, you know, to get equal rights or whatever. Or as Martin Luther King was trying to um, um, uh, integrate into society, or as Malcolm X would say, integrate into a burning house. Okay, great. Now I say that only because, well, basically I got kicked out. Well, it doesn't matter. Anyway, I ended up uh, going to the Air Force and then after that I uh, went to um, uh, a college in, in, in New Jersey, um, Livingston College, part of Rutgers University, you know, aggregated colleges. Interestingly enough, this is about 1960, 60, um, not 1974, 75, whatever happened. Interestingly enough, uh, Bob Marley came on the scene real heavy and a lot of uh, Jamaicans 
But you didn't even know each other. All of a sudden, they started using their patois. They were proud to be Jamaican. You know, it was interesting. I mean, I saw the sister. She was one day she was speaking like Black American, and the next. You know, they, she was like doing this, you know, Jamaican accent. I'm going like, whoa, how does this happen? So what I'm trying to say between 65 and, and whatever happened, there was a lot of people that were absorbed into the into the states, but um, no, they would take on, you know, they would take on the affectations of whatever whatever cultural society, dominant society, where they were they were around. Now here's uh, a more um, important thing. Let's go back to the Dominicans. And even the Puerto Ricans. In Puerto Rico, there was a thing where Puerto Ricans would not acknowledge their African ancestry, because to be a Puerto Rican, you have to be, you have to have your um, Spanish born, your um, Spain blood from Spain, uh, blood from Africa, of course, and blood from the Taíno Indians, which was the the autochthonous people of, the, of that island, right? But you know, you have some, you know, some light skin. Uh, um, um, Puerto Rican, you know, just denying. Then you would just have to ask, and it was a whole saying back then. Well, what was your grandmother? But what was your great grandmother? She had, she was African. See how that goes? Well, Dominicans were this. Was, it, Dominicans was even worse. I had a I had a I had a, I had a, um, a really good friend, uh, Josefina Micorazon. Um, she was Dominican. Um, this is mentioned later. This is in, uh, I, was, I had hooked up with Josefina in the, in the, in the early nineties. But she was Dominican, but she was Black Dominican. She could speak Spanish, English, and French. Okay. Um, because Domin Dominica or Dominican Republic is right next door to Haiti. But here's the thing. Dominican Republic, those are some of the most colorist, you know, people possible. They, you know, they do not like their black heritage. They, they put down on black people. Think about that, okay? Um, and, and at the same time, because it was happening, you have, you have, you have to, again, Economically, you had the, those those white Cubans coming over to Florida and having an uncle there, Florida, and also I guess uh, Union, New Jersey. But they also, you know, against that Africanness. You know, they're colorist, as I was, as I'm saying now. Okay, I don't call people racist anymore because it's just two charged words, colorist. Okay, let's forward ahead now. Nelson Davis, he sent me an article about this guy talking about you know Africans. Da, 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 da. Here's the thing. I just I wrote it. I, t I wouldn't digest. And in the end of this is um, recording this um, the, near the end of March, the end of January. I wrote this message, this this document, one of this, uh, talking about uh, uh, descendants of chattel slavery. And one one of the things I point out is that you know for from the end of slavery through antebellum. Through the you know the Jim Crow, the Jim Crow period, the, the course of lynchings, the whole '60s, right? We black people struggle, struggle, struggle. As, as, as we struggled on, of course, the forces came against us. Let's call the forces of Anglo-racist white supremacy, right? Now that's the Anglo-racist white supremacy is a system, right? In the states, it's 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 about slavery. In the in, on the continent of Africa and other places, it's about colonialism. But it's still the same, you know, uh, masters, if you will. And now struggle and struggle. Da, da, da. Now what happens is as we gain these struggles, about same thing, about 1965, as uh, Lyndon Johnson is signing this thing, uh, you know, about civil rights and all the rest of that stuff, they also signed this thing, basically uh, uh, letting uh, let's call them immigrants in. Now here's the here's the trick. The immigrants that came in from then and then start flooding in in the, in, the, in the 90s and into 2000s, uh, they took they had the advantage of the struggle that you know descendants of 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 um, chattel slavery um, um, uh, well, uh, struggle for they they had those advantages the, those gains that we made those those significant things that we that, that we made they had those things so they they would piggyback uh, basically they could jump over us because of a number of reasons let me just go into it for just just a second the thing is. When you are, especially, and I've noticed it here, when you come from another place and you come to a new place, you tend to co coagulate with your, with, your, with, your, with your people of your culture, right? And therefore, you know, you, this, that, the, the classic example is, 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 uh, is, is, is the Chinese, especially in the States. They would, they would get these like little groups 
and a, a new person would come in, they would give them money to start a business, da, 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 they would stay with that group. And every time somebody knew, the group would give them money and then the, the business would grow and that, and that thing would grow. Um, every time uh, uh, the descendants of chattel slavery tried to do that, of course, they got crushed in, in for a number, of, a number of things. So, uh, also, let me just, um, I know I'm jumping around, let me just, just, just be clear about this. What was interesting when I was wondering, like, uh, when the Koreans uh, started coming to the States, they would really treat black people bad. I'm going, why is this? And this was basically in the in late 80s, 90s. And I realized that what was happening is that uh, the television programs that they would get, the middle class, you know, the, the, the middle class strata of the Koreans and other immigrants would come in, they would be seeing these programs, let's, let's say programs like Good Times. I'm talking, and they would hone in on Good Times, I'm, I'm talking about post John Amos, not before John. John Amos, that, that section of Good Times was very interesting. But the, with just buffoonery, but I'm happy. So they would think um, these descendants of chattel slavery were fools and whatever, happy, plus you know, whatever it was. And so they would treat, adjust accordingly. Now, a, a component of that, let's just stay with, with say, say, Chinese. Interestingly, here in, South, in, in Africa, um, that they would, uh, Chinese were told that the Africans run around with no clothes, better, so they should bring, they should start business and have, have clothes, they have cheap clothes, whatever, I don't want to go off on that, but I'm just trying to say, these perceptions, these, these things that you get, in other words, the system of Anglo well, racist white supremacy, they send these images out to these other countries, then when they come, they have these preconceived notions about the autochthonous people of, of the country that they're coming to, and they, they act accordingly, okay, almost like gangs. So, what I'm trying to say is this: it's, What's more interesting, sitting here in South Africa, remember with the uh, the uh, apartheid struggle, the um, the 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 ninety percent of autochthonous people, the the, the the that were being controlled by the ten percent of the um, settler colonists, right? Um, the, the, when those ninety percent, when they ask for help outside to liberate themselves. You know, to liberate. They ask for help. Okay? People just didn't come in automatically. They asked for help. And they got help worldwide. It's one, one of the, I guess, the only new that had worldwide help. I need to have that asterisk there. Because the folks that come, that came to the United States, they, they were, we, we, we're in a, a lot of struggle in the United States. They didn't come to help us. Get out, you know, to get our our, our, our our justice, you know, the guarantee that everyone is treated fairly, you know. They did not do that. They came to exploit the um, the situation of this capitalist uh, uh, entity, order, and then it started to morph really bad. Now, so we didn't we, we, we didn't invite them. Now, interestingly enough, let me jump in again. When I traveled a lot, when I went to when I was traveling in uh, early nineties, a lot, or eighties, nineties, uh, a lot. Like for instance, when I went to Brazil, the brothers would just be asking me about the Black Struggle movement. Even in the Caribbean, you know, I mean, people, uh, a lot of the movements were informed by the Black Power movement. Even here in South Africa, about the Black Pico, informed by the Black Power movement. Right? Okay. So therein lies the problem. We have a struggle that the folks that are coming to, that are taking advantage of the gains that we made, though those folks are coming and putting us down, they should be deferring to us. They should, or as, as Yvette Cornell says, they should be treating us like white people. Because without our struggle, they couldn't possibly be there. There's other things I can say about, about whatever. So my, my point really is this. Say what you will. Excuse me. Say what you will, what you want about black folks. And yes, we've been decimated and continue to be decimated because no one from the outside that we didn't invite is coming to help us. They're coming to put us down, to, to hurt us. Therein lies the problem. They don't come here and, 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 and listen, in any movement, all, all these movements that come, the women's movement, the, the, the gay movement, whatever have you, they take advantage of the things that we uh, put in place and then they don't help us. A, 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 an example, for instance, you got, you, for instance, you had this, I, I mentioned this someplace else, you had this uh, women's march, whatever have you, for, for women's rights, whatever have you. But are they marching to, uh, to find those missing girls in Washington, D.C., and other places, the missing black girls, right? 
You had, you had, we had, we just had a president, Barack Obama, who, who gave reparations but to a bunch of people, right? But did nothing for black people. You, you had a justice department under a black president with, with black uh, heads of departments of justice and all kinds of uh, just whatever have you, and they could not stop. They, keep, they couldn't arrest the prison, the, 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 the school, the prison pipeline. In fact, in fact, they encouraged the school, the prison pipeline with these charter schools or whatever have you. So when people come and say, oh, black people are nothing, whatever have you, well, well, black people are everything. Black people, I'm talking about black people in the United States of North America, and the Wilderness of North America, they are everything. We, we do... We have survived so much, and we continue to survive. So, this whole thing that's, it, I'm not, I know I sound a little upset, you know what I mean? But I want people to get a grip and to look at this stuff. You know what I mean? People, they, this, this article that, that, that Nelson Self sent me attacks the consciousness movement for looking to Egypt or whatever. That whole concept is about Sankofa. In other words, to, to, to get your mind so that you can look back and see your greatness so you can move on, continue the greatness of your lineage. That's what it's about. I don't, you know, I, I mean, I agree with a lot of things that they say, whatever, happened because people get too wrapped up in that because remember, even in Egypt, you know, you still had the downtrodden, you know what I mean? You still had this, this paternal system, you know what I mean? This, well, yeah, they, they were sort of mixed, but, but you still had uh, um, uh, uh, people in charge of you and then they would do what they did and you would have to do, do their biddings and you, you still have that. So, let me stop here because I know I've been a little bit long. But that thing is just, I mean, when I saw that, I said, wow. So, I, I mean, we, I, we all got work to do. But I implore those folks that have taken advantage of the struggle of descendants of chattel slavery in the wilderness of North America, and then come and have the nerve to not help us, but hinder our continued growth to not get our brothers. There are there are there, there are brothers in jail right now from the from the Black Power movement, political prisoners. That nobody. You see. Anyway, this has been a, a dispatch from from me T from the Pattersons taking the train to Tibet, letting you know what I only suspect.